Hello and welcome back to the Not So Thick Couple podcast with your host Ben Holden. So we actually have a guest on today's podcast. Would you believe it? Unfortunately, we've been scraping the barrel the last couple of weeks trying to find some guests, so we've <laughs> we've had to go with Lucy Davis. Feel, welcome to the Not So Thick Couple podcast. It's like, thanks so much. I feel like that wasn't a runway introduction. <laughs> well, scraping the barrel. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on the. Um, on the Not So Fit Couple podcast, but yeah. technically the Ben Heldon podcast yes. today. It's very exciting. We experience. are going to be interviewing Lucy on a 100k race that she ran last week, just in case anyone didn't know that she did it. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things that everyone would need to know and be a part of because it was such a big mm-hmm. Before we dive into it, a big thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring today's yes. episode, which we will tell be telling you a bit more about shortly. Oh, I was going to make it, shall I? Make it in a minute. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this part first, so straight face. Oh, do we have a joke? Mm-hmm. Okay. Ready, Cal? <sighs> okay. A little bit more ready. What do you call an IT teacher who touches up his students? Inappropriate. A PDF file. That was really good. That. So that one. Yeah, press it up. I don't think they were good to stop them on. The stop them on was a great episode. No, that's yeah. I mean, they were really funny. They were like really funny. That that's was good to be fair. Though, I understood. That I don't joke. even feel like you need the joke as soon as you say the word the word dildo. You just can't help but laugh. Well, because you envision a dildo in your head, don't flying you? at a windscreen. You know, when someone says dildo, what color dildo do you envision? Pink. Do you? I yeah. I envision light pink. What do you think? I, I think pink the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. light pink. Yeah. But mine's like a, like a skin color pink. No, mine's like is yours a luminous like a pink. Yeah, neon. Yeah, neon oh, pink. okay. So I picture like the color of like a flesh. salmon, like flesh. Yeah, yeah like an actual peanut. Yeah. <laughs> peanut. I think there's something a bit less funny when it looks like an actual peanut. Yeah, when it's the, like the, the, neon. Yeah, that makes it a bit more like doctoral, doesn't it? Like yeah. something that they'd have in like a doctor's. Like this is a penis. So just before we get into this, one of our friends, <sighs> don't know if he's going to be listening. Tough shit if he is. He it was like the first time he got introduced to a, a friendship group. Do I know this friend? Yes. Okay. And he just randomly decided to go to his car, pick up a huge dildo. And it was one of those ones that had a suction thing on the end. And he just stuck it to the wall and just left it. And just went like, bing. Who did that? I'm not saying his You'll name. You'll have to tell me after. I will tell you. I think I actually know. How random is that though? Like, just yeah, lobbing dildos on walls the first time that you make social was it new year we didn't ha- we weren't there oh okay i think i know who it is though yeah well okay yeah not to be repeated we'll save it save us save it for later yes. but also let me chow oh. down you on there these are the coffee ones i'll be just so the way ben eats those coral little coffee beans is beyond me yeah i feel like that's just off you have to do it off because we'll get a one star review <laughs> No, these are actually really nice because I've been so tired. Are they actual coffee beans actual inside? Actual coffee beans. Kyle, would you like a coffee bean? I would like a coffee bean. So they're essentially... They're really good. They're good, told you. They're essentially coffee beans just covered in uh, powdered chocolate. Thank you very much. You couldn't have those before bed. No, but that's why they're good because you just... Wow, really good. You can have a couple of them and you don't smash the shit out of them. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, I think you still smash the shit out of them, but I will not lie to you. You Great shovel though. them in. Chocolate coffee beans by Coro. The other nibbles we got this week wow. are... They're the coconut ones. What is... They're not I the think, coconut ones. Oh, do we eat all those? The date ones. They are the chocolate we dates. We've got date apricot. They're the apricots. Coconut. Chocolate yeah. apricots we've got as well. I love apricots. So these are all chocolate nibbles that me and Lucy leave in the pantry. <laughs> I don't actually think it's called a pantry in the UK. You know, I think it's called a utility. utility I think room. a utility just sounds like a washing machine. Yeah, so I we like call pantry it a pantry. Better. Sounds bougie. Yeah, sounds a bit snobby. So we leave them in the pantry and we just basically <laughs> eat them every time. Well, I eat them every time they go in. If you want to check any of the products out from Coro, please feel free to hit the link in the description and use code NOTSOFIT5 for discount. For discount. Whoop, whoop. But in today's episode, we're going to be diving into Lucy's 100k race. And I'm so nervous. Why are you nervous? Because I'm, like, I'm being interviewed and it's weird. How are you feeling today, after it? So it's four days later, I think. Yeah. Or technically, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. yeah, four days later. I feel really good this morning. Yesterday, I was so sad, as in like I just woke up crying. And I think 
some well loads of people actually messaged me saying this is like really normal once you've achieved a really high end goal that you set yourself for so long you have this massive high for a few days and you're riding the high and then you really crash I crashed so hard yesterday I was so sad all day I couldn't concentrate I kept <laughs> I said to you didn't I I was like I feel like I've got no purpose now and then Steph was messaging me she was like I've really got ultra blues I can't even imagine how you feel because Steph was quite a big part of that journey as Probably, well yeah. she did a lot of the runs with me well, yeah, and things there's, like that there's, there's probably another person who's quite a big you deal are also prep. a really big yeah. deal in the prep and we're going down that route you, you're naming everyone um but yeah yesterday was actually a really hard day i felt really disheartened and sad and i was trying to work but i was just too tired like i just kept falling asleep yesterday and didn't want didn't want to do anything mm. and i'm the type of person who finds it really hard to not work or be doing something so when you're like lucy stop working and just like lie down I'm like, I can't because I feel like I should be doing something. Mm -hmm. So I probably worked a little bit too hard, I think, Monday, Tuesday. So that's why I really, really... No, Monday, which is why I really crashed on Tuesday. Yeah, I think it's completely natural to get that crash after such a big event, not just physically, but psychologically as well. Mm -hmm. Once you've been prepping for something that long and then it comes to an end, your body and mind's going to be like, what do we do next? Yeah. Do you want to tell people your time and finish for the event? Yeah. I've got a screenshot of it because it's that. Do you want to just, just before you tell people, and I was speaking about this on the way back on the Saturday evening, is when you think of a 100k race, people potentially compare it to other 100k races. The thing that was crazy about this one that I didn't realize was how much it was going to be done through like fields, uphill, the mountains, the terrain, the elevation was weighed i thought a lot of it was going to be flat tons of it was just up and down hill wasn't it well i joined a facebook group the threshold race to the stones facebook group because i felt like that was for people who'd never done ultras and things like that or you know a bit of a yeah. beginner not elite and loads of people said in there like it is more flat there's some elevation oh my god literally as we set off within the first 7k there was a hill that literally took us like 10 minutes to walk up and it was so steep so I was horribly shocked from 7K in thinking maybe all the hills are in the first half, mm -hmm. but they just weren't. I think every pit stop I got to, I was like, oh my God, it's so fucking steep. Like what is going on? Um, but Sorry, with that as well, you we think we've got a video, Cal, haven't we, that we took, we can pop it on screen of when we saw you after 20K. I think it was 21K. And you came running me. through and went, basically, they didn't tell us that there was going to be this much ele elevation. That's when I knew I was like, shit. Yeah. It must be quite quite steep. Well, that was so soon on, which was also a bit worrying in my head. I was like, I've You're pretty happy done... go lucky with that bit though, because I think you're like I've just flowing 20K. into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because 20k wasn't wasn't a lot. But in my back of my head, I was like, oh wow, this is a little bit worrying because I don't know what's mm -hmm. I don't know what's coming. So my official time was 12 hours, 16 minutes, 42 seconds. And that includes obviously all the pit stops, stops the walking, because yeah. that's from chip time to the end chip, which was on our numbers. And then Strava got me at 11 hours 35 moving time at a 6.57 pace. So running time was 11 hours 35, but the, the total time for me to complete it was 12 hours 16. Which, and how many steps was that? 115,400. Isn't that great? It, it's crazy as well because we were speaking about it afterwards. And so many steps. Because Steffi's done, Nutty Foodie Fitness has done a challenge where she did 100,000 steps in a day. She's walking from the moment she got it's up to the lot. moment she went to bed. Yeah. And now you just trumped it. Yeah, in 12 hours. There you go, oh. Steph. There you go. I set you a new challenge for 100k. <laughs> Try and beat your step count. But yeah, that was a really weird thing though because I hadn't when you're doing it you don't even look at your step count you don't even look at the calories like yeah, i was course. literally just following to be fair it was really well signposted the whole thing like every kilometer you could see exactly where you were going those arrows and everything like that there's three, there three sorry there's three and a half hours and those red arrows spread spread over the the course is that what it was three and a half yeah and if you were if you hadn't seen one of the red arrows for 200 meters then that was a sign to turn around and go back onto the track really mm -hmm. i mean it that wasn't something I was necessarily worried about because I set it on my Garmin anyway. 
to keep myself distracted yeah. by following the map. I think it's quite interesting to be able to follow a map on your Garmin. I just think it's really fucking cool. So I kept going on that instead of looking at my Garmin kilometers because my Garmin, I don't know how it did it, but from literally 15K, I was like 0.6 ahead of the markers. Yeah. So when I hit like 20K, I was like on my watch, I was technically only like 19.4 and it was really messed with my head. So I ended up turning that off. So I wasn't looking at heart rate. I wasn't looking at anything like that. I was just looking at the map on my watch. So I wasn't like getting distracted. Mm -hmm. But on that point of the um, the terrain and the hills, I think what's really hard, because again, I've never done an ultra and I've not really done that much trail because I thought like, oh, it's going to be hard surface. It's not going to be too much trail. The whole thing was completely trail. The whole thing was just uncomfortable. So would you just pump? Mm -hmm. Did you not? The cow. <laughs> oh, it wasn't me. It's definitely you. The whole surface was uneven. Uneven. I remember one of the things you said to me: "Don't roll your ankle." I was rolling my ankle like every step. You know when it like flops yeah. onto its side. I, I was just, just like, that. "Oh my god!" But luckily, I met someone. His name was Ian, and Whoa. I say he you was. You met someone probably, called Ian. <laughs> he was probably in his late forties. And it was kilometer like 25 to 30. And this hill was literally like this. And I, so he started walking. So I started walking as well. I mean, everyone was walking up this hill. Did you and Ian just going for a leisure stroll, stroll together? Because <laughs> he was like, you didn't, Hi. you didn't tell me about this bit before. <laughs> no, you didn't. You and he Ian just like, went for a walk. You will have seen Ian come through. He went no, through a little bit before me. He was like, Hi, I mean, you're doing. Me. I'll find Ian on You're doing full. <laughs> full like full through non-stop i was like yeah yeah it's my first one and he was like oh you're doing really well and one thing he said to me because i think i was a bit of a low point because i was already struggling at like 25k i was like mm -hmm. oh my fucking god it's well far he was like as long as you're moving forward you're getting closer to the finish and i was like it's, be it's a beautiful saying <laughs> like so i i tried not to stand still or like just stop moving there was only one point where i literally stood there and thought I need to tap out. Like mm -hmm. I need to, someone needs to come and get me because I can't do it. There was only one of those in the whole 100K. Let's firstly take it back to the start. <laughs> me and how, Cal at the start. No, 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 no. Before that, how, how and when did you first sign up to do the ultra? Well, I think I've not even shared this because yeah. I don't know if it's embarrassing. I think it's more so hilarious. New Year's Eve, we so we've just moved to Chester and we had New Year's at Lauren and Ashes, and I'd had a lot of red wine. We were talking about New Year's resolutions and I said, I wanna do a ultra. And I went online, I Googled running an ultra in 2022. Race to the Stones came up, the Threshold series. And I was like, oh, I could do a 50K. Then obviously saw the 100K option and bought it there and then, paid like 170 pound or whatever it was because I was in the kitchen, no one was there. Went back in where everyone was drunk, having a great time. I went, I've just booked a 100K Ultra. I remember texting Cal. I think I texted Cal that night being like, oh, I've got a new challenge. I've booked a 100K. And Cal was like, what? <laughs> like, what have you done? And I just remember telling people and being so excited because I was pissed. And then I woke up New Year's Day. I was like, I booked an Ultra last night. <laughs> like, what the fuck am I doing? But I'm so glad I did. Because if I hadn't booked it, I don't think I would have done it. I needed that accountability, even though it was like seven months away. I just randomly yeah. booked 100K. Most people have a kebab and stuff on a New Year's Eve and you just booked the 100K. Yeah. I think, to, to be honest, it was probably the alcohol that gave you that Dutch courage to, to book the event in the end as well. But Yeah, it was. I had the, no idea you, what I was doing. You've obviously, you're in that top percentile because I think it's something like 2 to 5% of people the only, only two to five percent of people actually follow through with their new year's goals or resolutions so you put a big one on the list they ticked it off and you did it and me and Carl were having this discussion in the gym earlier on as well about how there's different types of people who with goals will treat them or they will communicate them in a different way so i have one person how have you done where you will tell a lot everyone. of people <laughs> and everyone, well, tell everyone about that you're doing it and it keeps you accountable to doing it because you've got the pressure of other people knowing that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, with one of the things that I've just taken up, I've told no one about what I'm doing. I've shown no one it. And even at the place where I've been going to do it, no one knows. I know though. Yeah, and no one knows I do social media stuff, mm. blah, 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 blah. I've kept the card quite close to my chest because what sometimes happens with 
people who announce stuff to social media or the world, psychologically what happens is that people actually reap the benefit of validation from others by putting a post up and telling people about it, which then detracts from doing the actual event or mm. task or goal itself and makes people way less motivated to do it because that validation that people will usually get from the end, people have already got even before they started it. However, I think one of the things to bear in mind with that is the type of event or goal or task that it is because my one i could tell people and they were like so what mm. whereas your one's obviously this massive thing that a super super small percentile of people will ever actually do in their lifetime so people will actually want to come along and with the journey and see what you're doing because it's super interesting i think that's why i told people because i couldn't there was no physical way i could have trained for 100k and my platforms not know my body changed too much mm -hmm. people would have questioned what i was doing and also because i was raising money for charity i wanted every single fucker to know mm -hmm. to like to help me raise the money as well because that was the biggest goal for me is why i was doing it in terms of i want to raise as much money as i can for breast cancer because at the time i booked it someone in our family had recently just died from it so it was very fresh in my head and my nan was still recovering so I was like, I'm definitely, I'm gonna do this for charity. It wasn't, I'm just gonna do it. So I liked having myself accountable to other people, as in other people, as in I told mm -hmm. thousands of people straight away because that's just the type of person I am. And to me, I think it added a lot of external pressure that I didn't really expect from telling so many people, as in Lucy, you physically have to do this because so many people know you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You're gonna let people down if you don't do it. You need to perform. And it made it quite unenjoyable. I think the process of the training, especially in like the last couple of months, I just I just wasn't enjoying the training as much. Like going out for four, five, six hours on my own was so, I just don't, I wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable. Like having to get up every Sunday at like five, six o'clock and just spending my whole day running it's not something I didn't anticipated at the start. Mm -hmm. And I actually spoke to my therapist about this. I was like, I feel like I put so much pressure on myself to perform, not only run 100K, but I wanna do well. And I've had that since I was like a swimmer, everything I've done, it's like, you need to perform in the top 1%. You need to be good at what you're doing. So I, I, I don't know if that's like my personality, but I put this so much pressure on myself to try and do well, which in hindsight, I've got new goals pending, which are fucking ridiculous, but I'm not, so oh, that, great. I'm not sharing that one, I don't think fully, I might, but that's kind of like a hilarious goal to me because I'm like, I don't know if I'll achieve it or not. Whereas with 100K, I knew I'd achieve it. I just didn't know to what extent. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely for me, I think telling people and explaining all the highs and lows was like a massive positive for me. Well, I was, gonna, I was going to ask you about what made you go from the, the the 10ks that we were doing because me and you realistically only really got into running through lockdown and covid we weren't avid runners yeah we weren't doing we weren't doing a lot and even then we were doing a couple of 5ks a couple of 10s we were doing them a bit leisurely so i, I think you kind of answered in that question but what was it that made you go from 10 to 100 because that's literally zero to 100 real quick and we we often talk about managing your goals and setting small goals <laughs> to set you up so that you don't push things too far and become demotivated but there aren't then there is certain individuals in this world like yourself who can set big fuck off goals and prepare for them and chase them down and smash them as well but not not everybody can do that not everybody and also i think this is bullshit where people talk about i haven't got time to do stuff and i can fully get on board with the fact that people have very very different lives however if you really want to do something, you will set the, the time aside to do it. You were getting up at early, stupid o'clock. You, you were sacrificing a fuckload. You sacrificed a lot of social life. You sacrificed other elements of your training that had been habitual to you for a long period of time. If you really want to do something, you will sacrifice other parts of your life. I'm not saying that you have to. However, the one thing that I don't like, which I think often happens, and even you've had some of the questions on social media, is were you just naturally good at running anyway? Were you just naturally fit anyway? Blah, blah 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 which takes away from the actual effort mm. hard work dedication planning preparation that actually goes into training for six to seven months for this event that you did 
And I think sometimes that's just taken for granted because people will fob offers. Oh, well, I don't actually have the time or the energy or the effort t- to do that. Yeah, I mean, I literally got that question yesterday, but just with your point there in terms of why go from like running, I think the the furthest I'd gone was like a 25K or a 22K before signing up for the ultra and that was in 2021. I remember doing it, it was just like really hot day and I was like, oh, let's go a little bit further. I'm a very curious individual to see how far you can push the human body. I don't know if that's from like a swimming background where we would constantly push ourselves so hard. I was, just, I was, I was so curious to see how my body would feel. Like, like, what? How can your, how can it, how can you do that? How can you run for twelve hours? What, like, what? So, it, I think I was more intrigued mm-hmm. to see if I could do it, and also I wanted to set myself something which was just ridiculous, which I didn't even know was possible but I wanted to set something that was ridiculous. But with what you said there, so someone asked me a question yesterday, would you class yourself as a good runner before all of this training, is it natural? And the way I responded, I basically said to her, uh, I say I was very fit before starting running. I was a fit individual, fitness is my job, but we only started running, I'd say last June, July, we were doing like 10Ks, 15Ks, 5k's 20k randomly here and there like once a week we'd go Mm -hmm. for a run and i think what people forget is obviously i swam for 10 years of my life competitively so my aerobic capitness my aerobic capacity has always been higher than the average person my lung capacity is astronomical i it just was as a swimmer we had to run as swimmers to keep our fitness up, which is wild thinking about it. Like you swim nine times a week and like go for a run. So that was eight years ago. Six to eight years ago was when I was a swimmer and you don't necessarily lose that fitness. However, there is no way in hell, absolutely no way in hell, I would have run 100K if I didn't train the past seven months. Physically impossible. I would have stopped. It was my commitment to the training. As you said, I missed out on social occasions. I wasn't drinking. My mental health got really bad. I lost a ton of weight. I put weight back on. I built muscle. I lost muscle. There were so many different factors. So I was a little bit pissed off at the question saying like, is it natural? Naturally, I'm very athletic. I have been since I came out of the womb. Genetically, yeah. But you can't pin what I've just done on being naturally athletic and naturally good at something. I had to put so much work in the past seven months, which to be fair, I do think people saw across the whole seven months, like everything I shared, the highs, the really significant lows, the injuries, people saw that. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I guess I think the question pisses me off a little bit because I don't like it when someone denotes your hard work to you're just naturally really gifted. I think that happens quite a lot with other things as well. I saw an argument online about being born into privilege and how that often takes away from people's hard work. And don't get me wrong, if you're born into... It helps. Yeah. If you're born into privilege or money, wealth, health, then there's going to be a platform in which you start ahead of other people, but it still takes hard work to get there. And obviously, we're not getting away from the fact that you are genetically a freak. Mm. So, but you are extremely hard work on top of that and that's what makes a lot of the best athletes in the world a lot of the best athletes in the world aren't just genetically gifted they're also training super fucking hard as well i think a big factor as well not to forget is my parents like my dad has done fell race ultras he he when i said i'm signing up for it he was the one person who's like yeah you'll, you'll do that it's part you'll of your family that. culture it's our family culture. It's what we do. My my dad on the day of the ultra, he knew every he the, the GPS points. He knew exactly where I was, what I was doing, how I'd be feeling, what I'd he. So in terms of my parents, they always knew. My dad, one hundred percent. He gave me all the tips, like have cold potatoes, mm. try this, try that. If you don't like this, don't. He was so like you're gonna do it. And he was the one person I said to you at the start, the one one person I want to make proud is my dad. Mm -hmm. and i did because the video at the end of me hugging clive is so like that is my favorite footage of the whole event that video of me and my dad hugging and he he goes but did you enjoy it no (laughs) yes dad (laughs) like crying but no i am really thankful for that because he was very helpful in probably ways he didn't even realize i actually thought when you started the prep for it that you weren't going to be able to do it 
same within uh, two months no no not nothing about the way that you were training nothing about your fitness My hip. there was one day that we went to do intervals at the track and i was doing intervals as well at the time and we were on the 400 meter running track and we started doing we'd done about two or three laps around it and then i just saw you hobbling like fuck you were in a lot of pain and you'd had issues with the hip previously as well mm. and i was like she's not gonna be able to do it she's it doesn't matter how much physio you had you in agony with your hip and I think you went to see the specialist that I'm seeing at the moment. I think even he was skeptical. And I know our current physio is skeptic- skeptical about you really being able to do 100k when you were getting a couple of k in. The hip was in agony, wasn't it? Yeah. It. So I've always had like dodgy hips since I was about 14 as a swimmer. My dad also has dodgy hips. Um, and I'd literally been training for what, like literally two months maybe. And I remember that because the rest of that, track i was like i'm gonna do a 10k and you were like lucy you can't you physically look at you you're dragging your leg and i managed to do a 10k and i was trying to tell myself like i feel absolutely fine it doesn't hurt i couldn't walk like i was dragging my foot around like my hip was so bad i was so frustrated i think i took a week off running and went to see yeah went to see the specialist was consistently having physio was so anal about my rehab as in like you have to get better the one thing me and Kat said so Kat's our physio the one thing we said before I did my ultra so about two months out she was like I'm so thankful you were injured at the start and not injured now because I always had little niggles like I was always a little bit sore Mm -hmm. but the hip one she was literally like I'm so thankful you had that injury at the start and you managed to overcome it because if I had that same pain i mean my, my hips are really hurting today but if i had that same pain a month out i would have been so so nervous to do that race yeah because the pain i had in both hips when i was running was absolutely out of this world for about 30k my hips were because the hills i hadn't anticipated going up the hills like so your hip flexors i was like bent in half they were they were burning but then I, was, I think I just went numb like numb to the yeah. pain obviously what we're talking about here is something that's very extreme so we wouldn't advise people to just push through pain or no. to not be smart or train like when you've got injuries and stuff. But I'm the same now for, I've just started marathon prepping in week two and I've had non-stop injuries from the start of the year. But I'm at this point now where I've just got to train with injuries and try and rehab it the best that I can because... Train around injuries, best you can. Yeah, because I've got the event in 12 weeks. So I've just, it doesn't matter if there's pain there, I've got to fucking do it because I want to finish the event. I guess one of the positive positives is we saw how I overcame my injury and I think you can do the exact same. Like you're so, so consistent like I was with my rehab. Mm-hmm. Every day, twice a day, get it done. I think you'll be you'll be absolutely fine when you come to do it. And also the adrenaline just kind mm-hmm. of brushes it away. Explain nutrition because I think this was possibly <laughs> the hardest part, harder than the training perspective. The tr- harder than the training was in my perspective. And one of the things that you consistently took. Yeah was my eight, every single day no I joke i honestly one. think it's bit it, it whether you whatever type of training you do i just think ag1 <gasps> from oh wow that's a new one isn't it look at that guys he's like a little it looks like batman wow you sorry were, we've just got a new bottle and it's got like greens. a little a little thing in um no so we've been taking ag1 for months now yeah and it i can't open that ben can you open that for me please we've been taking ag1 consistently now i was obviously putting my body through a lot of stress throughout the whole process of doing the ultra but i was also very very on top of nutrition in terms of eating enough but what's really hard when you're trying to eat over say i probably hit like 4000 4200 4300 i'm not the type of person who like loves food i just don't i my app i did before the ultra my appetite hit the floor and I found it really hard to eat things like veggies and fruits because they were really filling me up. So I couldn't eat the caloric dense foods that I needed to eat yeah. to get the calories in. And what I found with AG1 is I was having it every morning on an empty stomach. I was like, I'm just gonna try and pop this into my thing without getting the powder everywhere. I was having it every single morning on an empty stomach and I knew I set myself up for the day because even if I hadn't hit five this, five that, fruit and veggies, I knew I was getting yeah all my micronutrients and so i was super chilled about that in terms of nutrition um well one, one of the things is it's basically the foundation to your day so even if you know you're someone who's shit at getting veggies and fruits in 
you can take that and you pretty much set your foundation for the day. Yeah. And obviously when you're someone who's trying to get a lot of food in, it's well more food than usual. It can be quite tough on your gut. So to, you, yeah, to have that fun. to help with your gut is great. The guy who actually started Athletic Greens created AG1 because he had poor gut health. So it was to, to really help with that. And the other thing that's really good about it is you don't have to take a million pills. You can just take a scoop like you're doing now, wash it down and you're done. And it's cost cost effective. I also think it's super tasty. I usually have it with ice, but we don't have an ice dispenser on the podcast yet. So it is um, delicious. We have a discount link. Is it a discount link? Yeah, discount it should be link. it should be clickable in the podcast description or the YouTube channel, or you can copy and paste it into your URL if that's easier. And you will be able to get a free, is it a year? Yeah, yeah. Oh, of, where is it? Oh, it's hiding. Um, a year free of the D3 and K2, so vitamin D. And this comes in like a little pipette, so you just drop it under your tongue or on your tongue. And that's been brilliant as well. I mean, in the it's UK, we don't, get a lot, we don't get a I lot was, of sun, was, do we? I was, well, I was battering that through when we had COVID as well. Mm. Really good for the immune system and the central nervous system. <sighs> yeah, so use our link. There you go. Indeed. Back to nutrition. <coughs> well, on the, on the note of nutrition, I think that was probably the hardest thing for you, I think, from my perspective getting the food in yeah and you just yeah, battle with body I, image i really had a bad time with nutri i probably say from may may june may june july like the last three months i just couldn't get the food in i don't know if it was so when you come back from a long run and i was doing what two three long runs a week i come back i wasn't hungry and people would usually think, oh, you'd be starving after that. You're not. Like, your stomach's just been up and down for, like, three, four, five, six hours. You don't feel hungry. You probably had, like, gels or something or food and nibbly bits on the run. You've had loads of water. You've had your carbs in powder. You get back, you want to just sit down. And I lost six kilograms. So I'm six kilograms lighter now. I've actually put a kilo on, guys, <laughs> since the ultra. But I was six kilograms down from my normal body weight. And I'd been at 64 for, what, three years. My my weight hadn't changed. And I was seeing the scales drop. And I just felt like there was nothing I could do about it because the volume of the runs was increasing. My appetite was decreasing. And I just wasn't enjoying food. I really, really hated how my body looked. I was really insecure. One of the things that I've done for the past four years is build your legs, build your glutes. Watching that <laughs> disappear. I mean, people look at me now and be like, oh, she's still really muscly. It's kind of like I watched all that hard work from the past three years like disappear in terms of my physique. And I've been known as, wow, she is very muscular. She is very strong. That identity started to really fizzle away as the training volume for the running got more intense and it was this constant battle in my head obviously i was still weight training i was going four times fives a week i was doing my 80 90 k run weeks but i was just watching like my body and how i identified as this strong muscular woman like disappear and knowing that and people are like oh you could have done something about this fucking what could you do how could i if i was eating physically as much as i could so much food for me at the weight I was and what I was doing. I was still losing weight. I was tired all the time. Like there were so many factors and it ended up just being get your head down, get it done. And then you can set yourself new goals after it, which is why I feel so good about my new goals now because it's a new process. It's a new chapter, very exciting things. I'm still gonna be running, but not to the same extent I think that I was. <laughs> what you do though is through those experiences, you learn a lot about what you did and didn't do. I used to sometimes watch Nick Bear's YouTube and be like, why the fuck's he having those shakes with like 800 calories? And it's purely just to get calories in. So I don't think it's a case of you wouldn't have been able to get them in. You just weren't experienced mm. at eating around an ultra marathon. Mm. And that's fine. And you learn from those experiences. Even on the actual ultra though, I, I knew the most unprepared thing was the nutrition going into the ultra. When I did the 60K, which was my longest training run, I had three gels, two flapjacks, and my two water things. And that was it. I was just chilling. I don't fucking, I don't know. I didn't, I, the, I couldn't eat whilst running. 
the thought of it, I constantly wanted to be sick when I had to eat and stop and eat. I hated it. On the day, I was like, I've got my gels, I've got a few flapjacks, got my water, got my car powder, got a few gels in the back, got a few flat, and just like, well, off you go. So the nutrition for me, I wasn't fully prepared. And I, I think I already knew that going into it because it just wasn't something that I nailed personally. However, on the day, it was fucking great. I think a lot of people worried about you though with the eating. Yeah, like, even all, really the, all the bunch of you were there because we, <laughs> yeah. we knew that you weren't eating a lot. Yeah. So there were seven pit stops across the 100K and at every pit stop, I would have a flapjack and two pieces of watermelon, a flat Coke and a juice every pit stop. But obviously you guys couldn't see that I was still eating mm-hmm. every single time because you didn't see me at all the set pit stops. And then as it was creeping closer to the end, so I think the last three I saw all of you, or the last two, I definitely saw all of you. Me and Carl tried to make it to a a few of us. We tried to make it to as many as we could, like those little midpoint ones as well. Yeah. And by the time it was getting to where I had like a half marathon distance left, I was so not hungry. I couldn't even explain Mm -hmm. it to you. And the only thing I could physically have was gels. So when you were saying, eat this, have this sandwich, I was like, I'm going to be sick if I eat that. And it's really weird because the, it was like little and often that I was eating. Mm-hmm. So around the whole 100K, I was always nibbling. I was always eating. I was always drinking. But it was really hard because you guys couldn't see that. Yeah. You could just see me at the pit stops and I'd restock up because I wasn't standing and eating at the pit stops. I was doing it whilst I was running mm-hmm. um, just because I didn't want to stand around for too long. That was one of the things. When you get to the pit stops, you don't want to be there for too long because you're never you're never setting off again if you get too comfortable you could just never set off again um so yeah i mean the nutrition is something that if i did another one ever i think i'd be quite clued up on going into it maybe you need to take the courtney do water approach and you go for tacos and beers yeah tacos and beers she has like cheesy tacos but again her nutrition isn't like optimal or whatever she's very very individual to to each person it's like when i was coming through they had loads of fruit and I was like, that looks so mouthwateringly yeah. delicious. And Cal was just getting me watermelon because it would just melt in your mouth and it would like hydrate you. Yeah. Bear in mind, guys, it was 26 fucking degrees. It was so hot. That was hot. the thing that you unprepared for. It was so hot. Nobody was prepared for that. There was a lot of do not finishes, unfortunately. And How I many think was it was there? the heat. Over 400, 500 do not finishes. <sighs> Which most people in the Facebook group, if, if they said they didn't finish, it was because of the heat. And... They, they, they couldn't cope with the temperature, which is why I'm like the fruit, the watermelon, the flat Coke. I mean, for me, flat Coke. Yeah. I don't even drink Coca-Cola. You sniff it, yeah. And I was, <laughs> I was loving it. I was like, get the get the Coke in, get the juice in, watermelon. And that was, was there, it. Was there a point where you were like, I'm actually going to quit here? Three. What are the three? There was three significant points. So I wrote these down because I didn't know if you were going to ask me this question. No, there was four. Four. I lie, there was four. Oh, you, I didn't, think, you didn't tell me about these. I th- one of them was significantly bad, but then the other three were kind of really low points. So the the worst one where I thought I was going to have to call you and say, I'm tapping out, was 54 to 59K. That, do you know why I knew that one was going to be a, t- a tough one? Because that was a period of like where, when we were trying to base where your pace was, that was one of the slower segments of the course yeah and during that segment just to, to pop it in there two things happened from our perspective oh, but I which, didn't which, see. I, which i didn't tell you a woman reversed into your car yeah and hit her. i yeah. was like what the fuck's going on here and just as i was coming around the corner but i didn't i didn't clock on did i no nah. i didn't notice and we lost the mics yeah and you lost the mics i'll take it a good portion of the blame on <laughs> some of it some of it was going to go wrong along the way and if we lost anything a little mic wasn't wasn't the uh the end yeah. of it i think the biggest one was that someone smashed into your car i didn't yeah. want you only told me that well as you we were running in the woman had just pulled into the space from after hitting your car did so, i did i did i pass the woman yeah, yeah she was there <laughs> to be fair she was so she was lovely to be fair i was really yeah. apologetic um yeah so kilometers 54 to 59 were absolutely awful the terrain so the ridgeway is white like white stone rubble and it was 26 degrees so this was the hottest point of the day that you were looking down and it was just in your eyes so it was like reflecting and burning your face so i was really hot and then there was like rolling hills i think everyone struggles on that bit because 
we knew the pit stop was coming up, but because we were so, there was no roads, we were we were in the middle of nowhere, I knew I wasn't gonna see you, or see anyone, and to get to this fucking pit stop, I think everyone basically complained, you had to walk through this like little path, like one foot in front of the other, yeah, you couldn't yeah, run, yeah. grass like up to your waist, so you were getting scratched, you couldn't run, which is the annoying thing, because if you wanted to, you couldn't anyway, because it was so uneven, you got to this pit stop, you had to get your stuff, turn around and come back, I was taping my knees up, had a little cry in the toilet, I was like, fucking hell, um, but before I got to that pit stop, it was at 55k. I just stood there. I was like, oh God, you can't go on, can you? I was like, you're going to have to stop. Like, was that the physically worst one? said it out loud. Yeah. Physically said it out loud. Nobody was around me because I was, so I was like 56 overall yeah. out of like, what, 2000. I was in the top thingy percent and we were completely dispersed. There was, as in, if you saw a runner, it was like the odd runner. Yeah. There was no big groups of people. I just stood there. And I couldn't talk to anyone. I had no phone signal, had no music, like nothing. It was so hot. And I was like, well, you may as well just like tap out here. Didn't. I don't even know how I carried on. I can't remember. Just did. Got to the pit stop. Is that because you were in pain or not? I was exhausted. I think I was just like absolutely exhausted. Um, Do you think that's what the pain cave feels like? Or do you not, not feel like you hit that? I think I hit the pain cave at 79k. Really? Yeah. So the other point. There was a video of this, Grant, randomly. Yeah. We'll put this on screen as well, Carl, can. This is the video of you coming into. So it wasn't a checkpoint. It was 79, 79 before okay. I saw all you lot at like 82 or something or whatever it was. Or 80. There was a really big gap between one of the pit stops. But Grant, Lauren and Ash and Steph were there. And I, I saw, I could see them. And I was like running, but kind of like, I couldn't really, I was really dizzy. Like I couldn't really see. I looked at Ash. No, Grant was going, what, what do you need? What do you need? And I just went, gel. I was like, gel. I couldn't even speak. I was like, I need a gel. And he poured water down my back. He gave me cold water. They were trying to just like calm me down. I looked at Ash and just burst into tears. And I hugged Ash for like 10 seconds and then like dropped like dropped my hands to my knees, got up and went, I have half marathons for fucking breakfast. And that's what I said. I was like, Fuck, I've got a fucking half marathon left. Yeah. I was like, I do that a couple of times a week. Yeah. I'm chilling, I'm fine. And I just went for it. And after that 79K, that was my fastest split. I was going like 540s, 5.45. And I just felt good because that's when I then saw everyone at the, like, the last pit stop when I came in looking really strong. You yeah, well, I knew you were bad then because I was at that next pit stop and I said to Steffi Steph. messaged and said, because I was supposed to run with you from 82K. Yeah. You little, couldn't have anywhere, you know, bit. though, because you would have just been like completely in the fields. I would just have to walk back. <laughs> but I was going to run with that last bit to keep you motivated. But she messaged me like, she's not good and she just wants to w run on her own. I was like, cool. She's obviously not in a good place. Yeah. Do you know what it is with that? Um, it's really weird. You think you want people with you, but the last thing you want is people with you in the end. So Steph ran with me for like, I don't know how far it was, about 10K. And I was in a really good mood and it was lovely to chat to her and see her. And then after that, I said to her, I was like, something happens. I don't know what happened to me. I was like, I was like, Steph, can you just drop back? I was like, can you run like five meters behind me? Mm -hmm. I, was like, I, just, I was like, I'm really sorry. I just don't know what's going on. Like I can't be around anyone. Yeah. And she was amazing. She dropped back and she stayed behind me. And that's when I saw everyone else. And mm -hmm. then Steph stopped. And that, I mean, Steph was amazing. Like she was incredible. She completely understood that I wasn't in the place to talk to anyone. And I was probably going to give up. And then the last one was 92 to 95K. They were the longest Ks of my life. 92 to 95, really? Yeah. It was so long. It was so, again, on your own terrain was like horrible on the ridgeway and it was even harder because you're so close to the finish yeah. but every kilometer literally was so far away it was a... i was like why is it i was like something's wrong when you're counting down things i often feel yeah because that's when you do start counting down yeah. isn't it when, once you're past like 90 mm -hmm. but again this one my garmin was like really ahead of the things so it would ping i was like you're lying i was like you are lying and i was telling cal this because loads of people said did you listen to music what i may have erred with is my playlist that I had for the run wasn't downloaded on my Spotify. 
And so, and there was no, where we were running, there was like one bar of 3G. So I didn't really have phone signal. The one song, the only downloaded song on my Spotify was Viva La Vida by Coldplay. It was like, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I had to put that on repeat. It's your most hated song now. Probably, yeah. It was on repeat for, for like, I probably, I mean, me, like 10, 15 minutes. Eventually I had to turn it off because like, this is absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, they were some really, as in like, why are you doing this yourself? Your body's in so much pain. I think, I thought I'd dis dislocated my knee, didn't I? I think I yeah. said that she won the pit stops. I thought I dislocated my knee, so I didn't look at it the whole way around until the finish. I looked down, I was like, oh, it's fine. I don't know why I thought I dislocated it. it. Just, I went over something and I was like, felt weird. You broke your knee. Don't, don't look down. You broke your knee. Keep going because <laughs> you don't, you don't want to stop. What other, what other little injuries and aches did you have along the way? The hip. Did, was that hurting, was it as well? Was so yeah. bad. So my my Achilles started hurting at 15 k Okay, let's just pop an image on the screen of Lucy's Achilles because you look like the elephant man. Yeah. You've literally got hooves growing at the back of your Achilles. If, you, if you're not watching on Spotify or yeah, YouTube, switch over and have a look at these images because I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. So this was a, yeah, this was a slight issue that I knew I'd hit really soon on. Because I've, so I changed my running technique about five months ago to be more front foot than heel led. Yeah. Because heel led was hurting the hip. So, I, and Lee was like, you need to be more, you know, on yeah, your toes, toes front. I changed it. And then my Achilles were the only things that were then hurting from there on out. Mm -hmm. Within 15K, my Achilles were booming. I was like, oh no. I was like, you've literally got 75K left. Oh no, more. What's... 90 85k left i thought you've got 85k left you can't feel your feet what are you gonna do mm. just had to keep going balls of your feet so like the actual bottom of your feet absolutely killing but i think foot foot pain you can just deal with yeah. and then my i think about 30k in my little toes like i thought i hadn't cut my nails down properly and i thought my little toes had dug in to my toes next to them and they were bleeding that wasn't the case they just blistered like you would never the blisters were just disgusting okay, yeah, yeah. Like two little leeches on the side of your feet yeah we'll put a picture of that which is a, the, is a good indication screen. that you were running well because the, the no the blisters were really identical on either side so you're obviously quite efficient you, yeah efficient at running yeah and then my lower back was really sore i think because of the hills my hip my hip was just but that was like oh you know pain's temporary mm. That, that actually quote did go through my head. Pain is temporary, quiz in Glossopera. Those proper Google <laughs> quotes that you tell them to forget about. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. The Google quote, I was like, because my mantra wasn't working. Really? You are strong, inspirational, amazing. I was like, fuck off, you're really not right now. <laughs> so it was pain is temporary. Yeah. The pain isn't going to be here forever. This is how your body's supposed to feel. And I kept saying, like, how, how else would you expect to feel? How else would you expect to feel, Lucy, at 70K? You've been running for like nine hours, love. Mm -hmm. You're fine. That was kind of my thing moving forward because i think stuff like that you know when you're doing it yeah i just felt like i could deal with the pain and i did it wasn't ideal but you just have to so the breaks did you take any on the fields outside cubicles okay so i had one really embarrassing moment <sighs> actually to be fair it's not as embarrassing because no one was around but if someone was there it would have been mortifying mm. the pit stops there was toilets at every pit stop yeah. i'm the type of person who literally shits themselves on runs i don't know what it is or what happens to me can't control it cannot con on my training runs couldn't control it i was like i've got like runner's colitis or something um but this didn't happen during the ultra because there was pits i first thing i did was go to the toilet then get your food then go use the toilets they were brilliant fantastic proper portal loose loving life okay i got to 90k and something had happened to like my bladder or something not that i needed a wee but i got like it was either severe dehydration or cystitis. And I just, so cystitis is obviously when like you think you need a wee, but you can't go. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just stopped at like 91K and just no one was around. Well, there was someone who I'd just like overtaken, but I knew they were coming up. I was like, it's now or never. And um, I did a little wee at like at the side of the mm -hmm. ridgeway. 
because I was new to go. And then I ran about 500 meters. I was like, oh, you're not finished. Like you still, you clearly still need to go. But I wasn't, it was all like in my head. So I just stood there, like pulled my shorts to the side. And I was like trying to wee because I couldn't, I, I was like, what's going on? I was like, am I bleeding? Like something's happened. And it wasn't, I think it was just severe, severe dehydration thinking that I needed the toilet mm-hmm. and I didn't need to go. And then that was, so that was the only thing where I felt really, really uncomfortable like down there but the, the toilets were just well, they didn't get like a runner's nappy or something i was thinking that you know halfway around i was thinking it could be easy just wear a nappy and just shit yourself be so much easier i mentioned yesterday on instagram story about how a lot of the time our wins are on the other side of some kind of pain or adversity or negativity what do you think your biggest win was or what do you think your biggest learning point was from the whole experience i think the biggest win is how adaptable the human body is Mm -hmm. my body started to adapt to you are an ultra runner that you can run anything like you can just do this which i thought was really cool and then it's now going to adapt in a different way to do this other thing that Mm -hmm. i want to do so i think that's a massive win to see you can do all these different amazing things and nothing is nothing maybe a bit of a stretch if someone said to me go and train for 100 miles i could do that i feel like i i would be able to do that because i've already been through Please some don't. things <laughs> no, I won't. The, the only other thing i do is probably an iron man but not for a couple of years no i'm only joking i'm not saying don't do it it's just i wouldn't want to put myself through that again yet anyway i'd have to give myself i like think a it's good hard break. that isn't it like you can never say never to doing stuff and it, i am all i 100 percent understand of why you want to challenge yourself physically and mentally, especially when you train for big portions of your life and you're someone who trains regularly. Sometimes you get comfortable doing the same stuff over and over again. I understand those challenges and why you want to be in a different place in terms of the pain, but also a different mindset and what you are truly capable of doing. Yeah, I think that's I think it's so fascinating what you can put your body through. And also people like, no, you can't do it. I'm like, oh, okay, watch me. I think that's a really strong motive when someone's like, oh, I don't think you should be doing that. Like, oh, like a little bit patronizing. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, well, watch me, it's fine. So maybe that's, I forgot the other part of your question. You said that the, was something I What I'd was learned. your biggest win or what was the, the biggest thing that you learned from this whole experience that you've gone through? Yeah, so that, that, that your body is so adaptable and you can actually do whatever you set your mind to. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but if you told me two years ago, oh, you're going to run 100k and you're going to do quite well. No. Fucking hell. Remember when we used to not. run 10k? When you ran your first 10k, I was like, oh my God, how are you fit? Are you, can you breathe? Are you still walking? That first 10k, I think I did my first 10k in like 53 minutes and we were just like, I was like, Ben, I've just ran a 10 fucking k. Yeah. And at the time, that was a great goal for me. So maybe now doing a 10k, yeah, is like a little, it's not that far for me. But when you you go through these different stages, so yeah, yeah I think it's fucking awesome you've what got, your body can you've do. You've got to celebrate those little wins. I also think that when you see other people break barriers, it makes things seem easier almost for things that you set for yourself. I think off the back of you doing the ultra at the weekend, a lot of people have done a couple of runs this week, feel inspired. There's a lot of people in the micro school community who are super inspired and have been doing the runs this week because they're thinking, fuck me, Lucy's just done... 100k i can go out and do a five mm. same for me i obviously watched you do that it kind of made me shake the tree a little bit in terms of my marathon prep and thinking i need to have to pull my foot on my horse a little bit here and get ready to do it but also at the same time think fucking hell i've only got to do 42k it made it feel way less daunting than what it actually is because you'd you had done the 100k and i think it yeah. will potentially be the same for other people in terms of when you see big barriers broken. And we've seen this throughout history of sport and other achievements that when people break down barriers, it then makes it seem more achievable to other people and it's not the impossible. Yeah, I actually got a message from someone and they said, oh, this is going to seem like nothing to you, like I'm embarrassed to say, but how do I get into running? And I said, never, ever compare to what someone else has done in terms of what they've just achieved because you've just said your thing like is embarrassing to say to start running I'm like but I want started running I was like never ever think that what you're trying to achieve isn't as good just because someone else has ran a bit further or lifted a bit heavier doesn't matter like push that off 
Like in my head, I was thinking, oh, oh, Courtney's ran 250 miles. That was more off-putting for me at the time mm -hmm. because I was like, Lucy, that's literally 500K. It was making my achievement seem worse. Yeah. So try not compare to what other people have achieved because you're not someone else. Compare to, okay, you're just starting running. That's fucking awesome. Get into just starting running. Yeah. Don't compare that I've just run 100K. The fact you want to start is great. So that's like a really big point I said to this girl. I was like, it's amazing. The fact you want to start is awesome. I was like, it's not embarrassing because I've done this and you've not even ran yet. It's so good that you want to do it. Um, so yeah, not denoting your own achievements mm. when you're trying to compare to other people. And that's the issue with like how you register things in terms of the difference between comparison and inspiration. You can use someone yeah, as yeah, yeah. inspiration or someone to motivate you, but as soon as you start using it as comparison, that's when you really get sucked into that mm. spiral of negativity and thinking I'm not as good as that. Oh, I don't deserve to talk yeah. about it. Because you've got to celebrate all those little wins along the way, like we've just been speaking about of getting your first 5K, getting your first 10 hitting your first time, whatever. And it doesn't even matter if you don't do more than that. Those achievements are just as big because it all depends on the place where you are starting and the place where you get to. Because someone going from zero to 10K, depending on their starting position, could just be as big as you going from doing the 10K to 100K because yeah. of their set start point of where they're moving 100%. to. And that's why everyone's journey is so important, important and so amazing and that's something that we get to be a part of on a daily weekly monthly basis with inside our community and seeing those people grow from set a to set wherever the fuck they want to end up being and it's truly inspirational to us because we get to to also be a part of that yeah i'd say it was obviously the whole thing i thought was very very emotional like poor everyone cried mm -hmm. everyone i think <laughs> i do have to say though because i know most people were listening who came. My support team was the best in the world. When we were at, to the last pit stop was 88. And you're like, you've got 12K to go. And as my dad, my dad suddenly appeared in the forest. I was like, Clive, I was like, Clive, I'm still running. And then mum appeared. I was like, oh my God, I'm at the pit stop. Um, and I'd obviously just seen Megan and just turned away. I was like, I'm really sorry, I can't run with you. And then I set off for the 12K and there was a guy just in front of me who he was, I think he was really struggling, like really like limping. I offered him some Haribo. I was like, do you want some Haribo? I was like, they're really good little like poppets of sugar. And he was like, no, no, it's fine. He's like, were they your like support team? I was like, yeah. And he's like, I've never seen anything like it. He's like, that is absolutely amazing. Like you should be so proud that you've got them with you. And then the whole last 12K I was like, oh God, I've got the best support team. This is amazing. And the finish was a bit different this year with Race the Stones. Like you came back up and you went back on yourself and long stretch, yeah. turn left and then came down this finishing like slight decline hill. And I could hear you. So it's probably about 0.6k to the finish, mm -hmm. like 0.8. I that, could it, hear that, that you. That stretch was 0 0.4, 0 0.5. What oh, God, I felt longer. Was it only for 0 0.5? Yeah. Oh God. We'd, we'd done the, the measurements on it. So. I could hear you all chanting Lucy, going, Augie, 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 like Lucy, 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 yeah. like shouting. And I was like trying not to cry because I was like, I, I don't want to cry here. Like, don't cry, don't cry. And I was with another guy who mm. was like running next to me. I just said to him, I was like, oh, you'll have to go ahead because they're for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I was like, you go ahead, like get your finish yeah. picture and stuff. Um, but you were all just amazing, like chanting. You were just so there for me, which I'd say if you, if people are looking to do an ultra, have like a little support team with yeah. you because it's great at the pit stops, but you don't actually know anyone. And they were so lovely that everyone was amazing, wasn't they, at the, the pit stops? But you guys were just so, you were just like, you were all swearing and just like, you fucking go for it, you animal. And there was, I think there's one point where Cal was like, go run another fucking 100K. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff like that, that I was like vibing with. Yeah. Like it was just the vibe. So I think that's why I could just keep going. Like everyone was knackered yeah. on that last stretch. And I was like, I've got quite a lot of energy. I but that's because of you. I was trying to reflect on it from other people's point of view. And the, obviously the, the achievement itself was great. But I think the other thing is that just the community that you've have with you and have around you and that yeah. we've built is it's so good to look at from other people because i think as human beings one of the things that we actually all strive for is to have a community and have family and friends around of us have that support network and it's so nice looking in just to see people who have each other's back and there was incidents there's incidents in the run where it was just nice to see that happen such as 
obviously his sister Meg went running out to find you at 5k and came came back without me <laughs> Cal went sprinting off with the cameras at one point to try and catch up with you and Steph Steph obviously went out running with you for a little bit Grant came after you with gels Ash and Laws were driving around everywhere me and Cal were fucking driving like <laughs> madmen everywhere mapping stuff out for you know map i run trying to get you at any point where there's an there's an extra road cal, cal was hanging out the car with cameras it was just like it was a it mom was, and dad in the van mom and dad in the, in the van they were setting up a different set point your dad came mom, mom set up chairs have yeah. a seat my mom yeah. will get back up your dad came running down the road after he's not long had a hip operation like <laughs> it was just it was all those nice little things from my point of view looking in which is I was looking for other people. Uh, the real big thing that I took away from that day was just the sense of community, and it was just great to see. Well, I also think that obviously with what we have with our community, like not the running one that I just did, but in terms of like the My Coach School, everyone in that group was like, "How's Lucy doing? Has anyone got a link? Can we track her?" Yeah. And that community we've created on like a separate note with the app and things like that is is ridiculous. Like everyone is there to support each other no matter what they're doing it could be your first 5k you could have just stepped foot in the gym loads of people have started doing the hybrid half program yeah there's a hybrid half program on the app you can use the code hybrid half for 21 percent off leave the link in the uh, description. link in the description and it's awesome to see because you then meet people online you meet people in a community setting we're obviously going to have an event pending in august yeah. which i'm not going to tell you too much about yet but it's this this ability to be a part of something is I think stronger than the goal itself, if that makes sense. Like being a part of the micro school community or being a part of that ultra community that I had was so exciting. And it, everyone was so lovely. Like everyone was so, so nice. And I was a newbie, I was a complete novice. So you couldn't, I did not feel invited yeah. or involved. I felt loved in yeah, that community. It's great. the first time I've ever done one. I was chatting to people on the way around, like, oh, this is like my sixth ultra. Oh, it's my fucking, fucking hell, it's my first. What <laughs> do you mean? It's just six. I was like, oh, what time did you do it in last year? 11 hours. I was like, oh, you can go off without me. And you just kind of chat to yeah. people on the way around. So I was thinking, you're well fast. Why are you like with me? Um, but that's what it is. You, you just meet people on the way, don't you? And it's just the whole thing was just hilarious. The whole thing was hilarious. I wouldn't call it hilarious. What would you say to someone who's looking to do their first ultra or marathon or in any kind of run? So I've had this question a lot in terms of like your first ultra. I think one of the things is definitely don't put too much pressure on yourself in terms of hitting a pace and a time because that's where I went wrong. I kept thinking, I was like, oh, I've never, I've never even ran it like a 6.30, 6.15 pace. That's like really slow for me. But it wasn't in retrospect of what I was doing. So like not setting yourself a ridiculous pace for an ultra because you're not elite. We're not elites. We're not We're not doing it to win medals. We're doing it to do it. In that fact as well, just kind of say myself and you aren't runners. Yeah. We're just people who've lifted a little bit and decided to do something just yeah. to give people that motivation to think, well, I'm just that person as well. I don't really do stuff, but you can still do anything. Yeah, you can absolutely do anything. I think one of the most important things is definitely holding yourself accountable to that goal you set yourself. Obviously, I did it to quite the extreme by telling every mother fucker on the planet that I was doing 100K. And I think telling maybe a few people if you wish to or being accountable by having like an app or a coach or something like that definitely holds you accountable because you know you've got that support there. And then also just kind of like definitely believing you can do it and knowing the fact you will walk at some point for our 50 or 100k and that is absolutely normal that there will be highs and there will be lows again absolutely normal and it only makes you stronger as a person but definitely definitely you know having a set training program to help you and stay accountable to i was so there was not a run <laughs> there was not a run that i missed even when i was so hung over doing a 45k i threw up basically the whole way with steph I still did it like I was just I was like tunnel vision into that accountability yeah. and I was tracking every run I did on the app so every time I did a run I'd log it and I'd watch my graph go up and down and people like stats in different ways don't they but yeah. accountability to a coach accountability to a friend knowing your body's capable of absolutely anything yeah as Ben said we're not runners but we can now run because we've held ourselves accountable to something and also it hurts but it's fine like it's fine pain it's good yeah. pain I was going to ask you 
what you're going to do next, but obviously we're not t- going to discuss that. I yet. have actually told people on YouTube. Have you? So I can. People can go. Do you want to tell people what you're doing next then? Yeah. So I've got four goals. Two of them are okay. So one is build muscle, like build a significant amount of muscle back on. Um, specifically my legs because my upper body is still pretty jacked, like it just is. I have just got big shoulders. Like that, I didn't lose that much size up here. Like oh, large. Lower body, I obviously lost um, a little bit of muscle in the last months of training. So build muscle, build strength, building strength back up to kind of what it was and hitting some one rep maxes. A sub 40 minute 10K. So my PB at the moment is 40 minutes 15. Would love just to do a fast 10K. I mean, that's already pretty good, but oh, like 39 minutes. Pretty good, that's insane, by the way. 39 minutes for a 10K would be special. So still definitely have a running goal in there, but it's like a 10th of the size. Yeah. And then the last goal is, so this is the one that I said that I don't know if I will achieve, but I think when I start the training for it, I will know I can do it. I want to hit a British record in bench press. (laughs) 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 And the reason this has come about is I'm starting doing some training with Ash. So Ash is one of Ben's best friends and one of my really good friends. And he specializes in powerlifting. I mean, he has clients who have broken British records left, right and center. He's broke a lot of British records. He's broke British records. And I came to him and I was like, okay, I'd love to do a session with you a week going over squat bench and dead. I was like, my squat, my deadlift might take a bit of time because of my hip injuries and building back up. And he was like, how's your bench? I like, it's pretty good. It's 73.5 is like the best I've ever lifted. And he's like, how, how much do you weigh? Like uh, when you put weight back on, I was like, oh, I'll be around 63, 64 kilograms. He's like, all right, I think we can go for a British record. I was like, what's the British record? He's like 85 kilograms. And then all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to get a British record on bench press. I mean, so what is it, Kyle? A 12 kilogram increase? Mm. Something like that. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a wild goal that I've set myself. I think it's cool though to be able to transfer your effort into other areas and just have those different goals and just check, tick, checkbox, done, leave it to the side, go move on to the next one. Yeah, that's a real interesting one though because I don't, in it my is, head, It I is don't... going from the event that you've just done. It's wild going from what I've just done to doing that. But I mean, I might achieve it awesome you will achieve it will achieve um but yeah that's going to be um a very exciting goal that i have pending i mean we'll just we'll just blame ash if it all goes tits mm-hmm. up i'll be like ash you said i could do that lad <laughs> no i'm excited well big round of applause to lucy davis on 100k Thanks, Absol- absolutely smashed it absolutely that was a good smashed interview. Out, out the park oh, this is my medal i am um, oh yeah you show people your medal can you show it to the camera yeah, that's a really cool medal it's really cool. It's like really heavy. I wore it for ages after, didn't I as well? I just had it on. But yeah, race to the stones. Whoop, whoop. And I am honestly proud of you beyond belief. I, don't, I think you are honestly a true inspiration, not just to women, but to people in general across the world. And I think one of the things that you should be proud of yourself is that you genuinely leave life in a better place than when you first came into <laughs> it. And I think that is something to, which is a fucking bigger achievement than you can ever wish to imagine. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> that's really kind you um you were the reason that i cried straight away at the end though because nobody could hear what you were saying to me no, no. and i could i'm not going to share because i think it's personal but when we were hugging there's i don't know who captured that moment but the picture of us hugging and i Calder, took my obviously. sunglasses off no i got there was an iphone angle as well oh, video, yeah. sorry yeah not the photo the photo really captured it but there was a video i think it might have been ashes and that was the purest emotion mm. that I've completely over overrode my body. And yeah, no, thank you. You were very, very supportive of the whole journey. You're welcome. What a great episode that was. That was great. That was, wow, I went for every emotion there. That was good. I think it's good though, because you've got to share exactly the whole experience. On an interview on the Ben Halden, ben Halden podcast. Ben Halden podcast. Later will be the Not So Fit Couple podcast in next week's episode, but that was amazing. That's really cool. <laughs> I should interview you after your marathon. I don't think that's as intense, to be it honest. It is. See, you've just done it there. I have done it. I have you've done just it. denoted I've compared... your own goal because yes, I've have... just done something that is a my, bit longer. My big goal, though, like, like I said to a few people, is mine's more to do with pace. So the one thing that I wanted to try and commit to and keep accountable to at the start of this prep was to hit under a 3 hour 30 marathon, which is a big goal because I've never run a marathon before. I'm not a runner. This is my first event i'm going to be documenting it all on youtube via a series called the unwind series the reason why it's called the unwind series is because i've done a lot of bodybuilding over the last 10 years and basically undoing 
a lot of the stuff that I've done bodybuilding in terms of being tight, the reason a lot of my injuries and niggles have come up is from being and lifting and moving in a mm-hmm. certain way. So I'm trying to unwind all, all of that. And the second reason it's called the Unwind Series is because I've mapped out on a Google sheet, which I'm going to be going through on next week's YouTube, my whole training plan for the next 12 weeks, which also has in it my social occasions for every week and i pretty much got a, really got I pretty much got a social occasion in every weekend for the next 12 weeks Happy so it's just to go to show that you can be and i'll be a bit getting wankered most weekends to put it politely you can go out drink be social and still have goals yeah bear in mind just on that point as well i did go out still but i just was like started to really rein in the alcohol purely because I couldn't be hung over. Yeah, obviously it's not it's not optimal but for what you want to achieve and that's yeah, why I've yeah. had to move all, to I've had to move in. my days around to accommodate for those social occasions as well. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. But is that the end of our interview process? That's the end of our interview, yeah. You're, oh, I can breathe. Yeah, you haven't got the job. What do you mean? It's the end of the interview, you haven't oh. got the job. You say you're not coming back on the podcast. <laughs> I am, I'll be back. <laughs> I'll be back next week hosting as well. Um, But no, thank, thank you for all the love and support and obviously we raised over three thousand eight hundred pounds for breast cancer which was which was the aim it's great Insane. Right, they messaged me and they were like oh my god this is amazing like we're so thankful like this money's going to help this this and this and it's nice knowing what it's going to as well because breast cancer is very prevalent absolutely brilliant and again massive thank you to the sponsors of this week's episode which is athletic yes. greens and and coro, coro. and um, make sure if you want to check out Lucy's hybrid half program that she's just been talking about, which is the running program. There's a couple of other running programs on the Migrate School as well, um, which are across various distances from yeah. beginners to intermediate. You don't need to be a runner to get involved in anything. If you just want to dabble in it, then please feel free to do so. You can use code hybrid half for 21% off. And that's across all programs, but specifically yeah. for the hybrid half, it's 21% off. Please continue to ask any questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, I don't know if people can leave questions on Spotify. I think there is a way that you can do so. Please continue to leave reviews on the podcast because they mean more to us than you can ever know. Yeah, five And star. make sure to tag the Not So Fickable podcast page on Instagram if you are listening and walking about or if you're tuning in your car, but wait till you pull over to do so. Yeah, because that is Danger Danger Mouse. Is that a film? Danger Mouse, potentially. But I yeah. think you're supposed to say dangerous. I think I was. <laughs> and we'll catch you in the next one, guys. Bye. Bye.